Kumar Vimalendu Singh is a versatile uh, scholar, a noted scholar, the, the Amazon bestseller, the only author uh, to be the Amazon bestseller both in the Hindi and the English category. And uh, his, his first book, uh, maybe Drohi Mangalgar, as well as To Whomsoever. These are two books for which he was the Amazon bestseller. And uh, you can Google him. He's a film critic. He is doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, writings on film studies nowadays on various kinds of films, various categories and genres of films. And uh, he's a product of Bharat University. And uh, you can you can Google him and you can find him. His his uh, he's a great poet. He's a poet. Uh, he's a bilingual poet. Uh, a poet who writes both in Hindi as well as English. And uh, is uh, easily accessible and available over Facebook and stuff. So uh, I'm sure you will uh, really adore and admire his scholastic abilities after he finishes uh, this particular topic, which I feel that he will best justify because I know him for a long period of time. And I, whatever academic uh, you know endeavors that I have had and academic reach that I have, ha I have in India, I feel that uh, this particular topic will be best justified by the man who gets me the screen. Uh, Dr. Kumar Vimalendu Singh, on behalf of Team Dark Boys, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have you today. And uh, once again, uh, you, are, you are back on our platform and we are very happy for that you are back. We are very thankful that you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, spared your time from the busy schedule. I, I know you are very busy nowadays uh, because of the various, uh, uh, you know, enterprises that you are engaged to. So thank you very much for joining and sparing uh, your valuable time and taking up the challenge with the first lecture of the series. Over to you, Dr. Vimalindu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. And uh, thank you, Basudara. And uh, thank you, all the listeners. And now you are waiting for long. So without wasting any time, uh, I must say that we must start. Uh, we, we, we shall start with the topic or the chapter that is Anglo-Saxon literature, the beginning of English literature. So uh, to start with, whenever I see a river or a rivulet, or whenever I see an ocean, uh, I forget to think about the drop of water. Whenever I see a hill or a mountain, I forget to think about the small rock that is lying on that uh, hill or the mountain. And similar thing happens in the arena or the dominion or the territory of English literature that when we look at our great poets, Shakespeare, Milton, Tennyson, and uh, Ted Hughes, Philip Larkin, and all, we forget those poets who started it all in the Anglo-Saxon times. So it is the, it is the epithet, it is the thing Anglo-Saxon literature from where the story of English literature begins. So today we'll talk about, we'll take a look, we'll stride in uh, that dominion, and uh, that was a pre-Christian era, of heroes in England and how how it started. In fact, how, uh, we'll come to know in this session that how England came into the in, uh, into the existence. So, uh, as you can see on your respective screens, that Anglo-Saxon literature is the spot from where the story begins. So, to give the background, let us know uh, a bit about the country about uh, the area from where it all started. And to start it, we must be aware of certain terms. So, the first term, is albus, as you can see on your respective screens. In Latin, white is known as albus. And why I'm telling you this, uh, not because the white part of egg is called albumin, to add this to your knowledge. Of course, that's why, because of white color, albus in Latin means white. That's why the white part of that egg is called albumin. And when the sailors approached the area which we nowadays know as uh, England, they approached it to sea route because there was no other conveyance. And when the, the hills that you were able to see on your respective respective screens that is of white color they, they are dover hills so whenever someone enters that territory of england through sea route these are the first first things to be visualized first things that you can visualize and they are known as dover hills and they are white in color that means albus this is the picture of dover hill 
Dover Hills, and they are uh, the first thing that can be seen when you enter that arena of the great English nation. And uh, they are white in color. That's why they, the country which we know as England today, its ancient name is Albion. It is very similar to the fact that India is known as Jambudvi or Bharat Varsh, but today we call it India or Bharat. Similarly, the ancient name of England is Albion. And you can uh, find it easily on the helmets of English cricket players. They write it at the back. It is very much visible over there. So Albion, that is the story of Albion. The ancient name of England is Albion. So from here, from Albion, it all started. And who were the people who started this literature, this way of life that they proudly uh, say today with all the pride, with all the elegance, they say that it is the English style. So first, the first thing that we must know about the literature or when we start talking about a literature, when we start pondering about the literature of a specific country in a specific period, in a specific fragment of time, it is very much important for all of us to know the political, the social, the other concerns related to mankind in those times. Because without knowing that, it is not possible for us to assume or to analyze or to rate the literature created in those times. And it is the very cliched and very uh, repeated definition of literature that literature is the mirror of society. So uh, let us take that definition. And according to that also, if we are not able to know about the society, if we are not having any knowledge, not any awareness about the society of those times or the way of living of those times, the literature produced or written uh, or preserved of those times, it will not be easy for us to comprehend or to understand. So that's why I'm telling you that white Dover Hills, this, this is this, that white man's burden and all this come from white Dover Hills. White is the color they are very proud of. They consider their skin colors to be white. And Albion is that identity card and that identity thing which they relate to. And this was the route from where they all came. Those people, the population that constitutes people of England today, they all came from this very route and this was the first thing that was visible to them. So it all starts when we find, when we read the accounts of Roman historian Tacitus. He wrote a book called Germania. It is, it is a very lengthy and very descriptive kind of scripture kind of thing. It is written in an elaborate form and it gives account of Germanic people, what he called to the people who approached this particular area or dominion through sea route, they, uh, that, that Roman historian Tacitus, because Roman civilization was at its peak in those times, and Tacitus being historian, being aware of the fact that some foreign people, some tribes are coming to this specific area, he named them as Germanic people. And he, in his Germania, gives an account of how these people who entered this specific area, that means England or today, whenever I say this specific area, you have to comprehend that I'm talking about that uh, England of present day. So when he, in his Germania, he wrote that these Germanic people, how they look to the Roman eyes, how Roman people who were already settled there or were uh, enjoying their, you know, civilization and the appreciation for it in those areas, they were already there. How these people who were foreigners, they called them, the Tacitus called them as Germanic people in his Germania. How they looked to the Roman eyes, how they behaved, what were their ways of this detailed description is in Germania. He talked about that. And other uh, beats, other account is there of beats ecclesiastical history of England. When these tribes arrived, as it is very much visible on your screens, you can read. Beats, venerable beats, we can uh, we say. <coughs> he was also one of the historians, or you can say uh, the writer who wrote about, he was a religious kind of writer, so that's why we call him venerable. So venerable beats, when he gives his account, he, he wrote ecclesiastical history of England and also that of English people. So when these tribes about which we are going to talk and who constituted the literature of this period, when I'm talking about them, when Beats gave that ecclesiastical history of England, it was after 200 years of the arrival of these tribes and they, and he writes, he mentions it in his writing that they came from three powerful nations of Germans and they were Saxons, Angli, and Uti or Jute, Jute people. 
So three three basic tribes were the Saxons, Angli, and Jutai. These were the three definite tribes which entered this part, this specific dominion that we know today as England. And we can easily see it on the map. The area darkened is that of Saxons. They came from low country of South Denmark. Presently, it is known as Holstein. Holstein, uh, that is east of Holland and cows of Holstein, they are very famous. So these Saxon people, they came from Holland, east of Holland and South Denmark. And this word Saxon, it comes from Sikhs or Sax, which means sword bearer or sword man. So these people, Saxons, were basically fighters. They were tribes, but they were fighter tribes. They fought and they were very apt, they were very adept, they were uh, very efficient in fighting. As uh, you can relate it with the uh, clan of Rajputs in India, they were of that type. Saxons were the people who were the fighters. They carried sword in their hands and that sword was known in that language, Saxon language, that it was known as Sikhs or Sax and that's why they were known as Saxons. So this was the first tribe, Saxon. The second one was Angles. Now see Angles, you can see the map. This is the map from where the Angles came. Angles, as the name suggests, Angle, when we study geometry, we read about angle. So when two straight lines meet on a definite point, the inclination is known as angle. And the shape reminds, of, reminds us of that hoop that we use for fishing. And the word angle also comes from angle or angle. That means hook. And these people, angles, they were basically fishermen. As I told you, that sections were fighters. Their chief trait, their salient features, as we uh, see in the products and all the, the, the main thing about sections was their fighting abilities. And the main thing about angles and their way of life was that they were fishermen. And the word, the name <clears throat> for their community or for their uh, whole group, it comes from that Saxon language and angle or angle is the word from where it is derived and it means hook. So this was the second. And the third that I told Utahs or Jutes, they came from the country east of the lower Rhine. Rhine, lower Rhine, near lower Rhine, Jutes from, they, they, uh, came from that specific area to England. So these were the three different tribes which arrived. Then they were least in numbers. <clears throat> so these three tribes, as we say, Saxons, Angles, and Jews, they came to this specific area and they started acquiring or conquering different areas. And we can easily see the map which shows that Anglo-Saxon kingdom. Kindly look at this. Just pay attention. See, this is the map. This is all about Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. This map shows you Anglo-Saxon, uh, the political map, you can say, it is of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. The Saxon kingdoms, they were to be found in south and southwest. Anglian kingdoms, they were to be found in east, north, and midland. And Jewish kingdoms, they were to be found in Kent and southeast. You can see that. You can see it. In Northumbria, Mercia, later on we'll uh, come to know that how Christianity, it flourished in North Northumbria and vanished from there and how the pagan people of Mercia, how they overpowered or they, over, they threw away Christians. This is the story of Anglo-Saxon society. So we'll come to know about these things later. But as of now, let us concentrate and revise it once again because uh, we have, we'll have to keep this map in our mind whenever we'll talk about the literature and the definite areas of this period that Saxon kingdoms first of all Anglo-Saxon is a is a common thing a common name Anglo-Saxon we call we have designated we have named it the nomenclature Anglo-Saxon is uh, always regarded together but Anglo and Saxon these were two different people two different tribes and let us revise it in Saxon kingdoms that was in south and southwest Anglian kingdoms that was in east north and midland and Jewish kingdoms were in Kent and southeast so we have to keep this in mind when we are studying about the literature of this time.
Now see, the angles were the most numerous. Angles were the people who were the largest in numbers. And that's why Anglo, uh, Angles and Saxons and Jews, they all were conquering different lands where Romans were already there. They were conquering because uh, Saxons were fighting tribes, Angles were fishermen, but they were large in numbers. So they constituted, they, they started exploring that area. They went there, uh, they fought and uh, probably uh, that famous line, uh, he came, he saw, he conquered, uh, might be inspired from this very place because they came, they saw and really they conquered. So Angles and Saxons, they were primarily, these two tribes were fighting and conquering the lands. And since Angles were larger in numbers, what they said that they named that place after their own, after the name of their own tribe, that is Angla Lond. And by gradual change, it became Angla Lond, and today we know it as England. So this is the story how England, the name England came into existence, and what is their connection with those Anglo Saxons. So uh, we can estimate it easily that if the name of the whole nation is inspired or uh, is taken. Uh, or uh, we have named it or the nomenclature of a definite place, a definite geographical area is uh, done because of the endeavors or the adventures of certain tribes, what importance these tribes are holding for that particular place. So Angles and Saxons and Jews, these were the three tribes and they did that. Angles were largest in number. That's why they dominated and that's why they named that area as Anglanon, which in uh, with the passage of time, the gradual with the gradual changes, which became Anglanon, and then we today know it as England. <clears throat> and what was uh, the thing that held them together? First was that language was same for these three Germanic people. Germanic, when I say, just recollect that uh, Germania by Tacitus. He called these three people, these three tribes as Germanic people. So language was same for these three Germanic people and uh, they considered themselves as a part of Germania. They worshipped and celebrated common heroes and anything or anyone different from them, they were called Welsh. They named them as Welsh. These are the terms that we must be aware of. These people were called Welsh people. Who were called Welsh people? I'm repeating it. We, we must know about it. The three tribes basically constituted the population of India. They were the rulers. They established their kingdoms. They were Angles, Saxons, and Jews. And anything or anyone different from them or those who were not part of their Germania or those who were not Germanic, they were called Welsh people. And in this specific area, they were Celtic people. The term Celtic goes for those people who were not Germanic. And Germanian people called them Welsh. And we today call them Celtic. The Celtics, what they decided that their, their uh, heroes, their language was a bit different from those of Germanics or Germania. What they decided that they withdrew from this congregation, not congregation actually, but withdrew from this group. This was the loosely held group of Goths, Burgundians, Lombards and others. Germania, Germanian people. Then and Celtics or the Welsh were not a part of it. They worshipped or they celebrated different heroes. Their language was a bit different. So they decided not to be with them and they withdrew from England or the Anglo-Saxon or the Anglo or the Anglo -Saxon lands. They withdrew from that very place in 4010 AD. But as soon as they withdrew and they were searching for a different place to settle in, they were <coughs> attacked by Picts and Scots, people of Scotland and other nations, or North nations. They were attacked by those people. They were also fighters. And they settled in Wales after that. And <clears throat> as I told you that different heroes, they were, they were celebrating different heroes. The most famous hero of theirs probably was that Camero Britain character or the Welsh character for Germanic people because the hero about whom we are talking, he, uh, the Germanic people did not find any connection with him so they call him Welsh but Arthur the hero Arthurian romances became very popular with the passage of time in uh, <coughs> those areas <coughs> so 
Celtic people, they shifted to a different abode, they made a different place for themselves, and now it is very easy for us to understand that Germanic people or Germania was a different place. Celtic people or the Welsh people, their heroes and their language a bit different was a different place and uh, more related to Ireland than England. So this was the case. Now we have understood the social the social thing that how these three tribes came, they established their kingdoms and they started ruling people over there. And when everything gets settled, when uh, they start following a system, whenever a population starts following a system, then only we can decide or we can find the path for art or artistic endeavors. And similar thing happen here also. And the Anglo-Saxon life and literature begins at this very point. To be precise, or to say it more uh, with more precision, the Anglo-Saxon literature is mostly about pre-Christian heroic society of the Saxon. That means, it must be known to the students, those who are studying, that Anglo-Saxon literature, whenever we do that classification uh, while studying history of literature, any literature, we do it for our convenience. So we can find out many uh, overlapping tendencies in different ages. Now, when I say that some uh, writer is a romantic, uh, some writer is a romantic writer, we can find a trace of Victorian uh, temperament in him as well. So that is called overlapping. So these tendencies overlap. We do that classification just for our convenience. Here also, but but whenever we do that particular naming or whenever we uh, mention those particular traits of a definite age or, or of a definite poet or definite writer or definite author, it has a lot of things to do with the social thing. And the social thing, as I described you, that was of heroes. The heroes who left their home, they came to explore an unknown land and uh, they conquered people over there. They established a system. They started ruling. And now the turn was of literature. And Anglo-Saxon literature is mostly... And the society in those times, that was not Christian. The Christianization or the conversion of those pagan people, they were pagan people. That was not started at that time when these people arrived. The Romans were there, but that conversion of people into Christianity, that was not there. So Anglo and when with their arrival, that position was a bit more consolidated that now the life and literature was all about the heroism, not about the Christian tendencies. See Anglo-Saxon literature. <clears throat> this is a term given to a lot of literature, a bulk of literature, a canon of literature that is preserved and uh, that is also preserved selectively. 30,000 lines of Anglo-Saxon poetry have survived and uh, nearly all of it is contained in four manuscripts. You see the whole age that we have deemed as Anglo-Saxon literature or the lot of the canon of literature that we are discussing today or we are talking about is comprised of the, those 30,000 lines that are still with us. You know, why only 30,000 lines? And why not more? Because uh, writings of those times, they are preserved already. But only 30,000 lines are with us to ponder over, to do the research or to think about or to talk about. And why it is so? Because as I told you that Anglo-Saxon age was about pre-Christian age and it was about heroism. But after that, after their arrival, gradually, Christian uh, missionaries, they started their mission over there with uh, Augustine, St. Augustine. And after that, whatever was important ecclesiastically or religiously, that was taken care of in a proper manner. Or we can say that was given uh, more of importance in comparison to those things written which were not ecclesiastical or religious. <coughs> Sorry. So 30,000 lines of Anglo-Saxon literature are still with us. And uh, nearly all of it is contained in four manuscripts. And what are those four manuscripts? You must know this. And uh, here we go. 
The first one is MS Cotton Vitellius, 15 British Museum. The most famous one, Beowulf, Judith, and three more prose works, they are preserved in the British Museum. And uh, that part of the museum is called MS Cotton Vitellius, 15th part. So Beowulf, one of the first creations of English literature and the most famous one. Judith, the manuscript of these creations, they are they can be found easily over there. The second one is, uh, this one is the first one. The second one is the Junius Manuscript. The Junius Manuscript, that is in Oxford, Bodleian Library. Here we can see Genesis, Exodus, Daniel, Christ, and Saturn. Easily you can trace it out. You see, let us go to the previous slide and, work, and uh, let us see it once again. See the works preserved here in British Museum. Beowulf, Judith, and three prose works. And these prose works are in pieces, not uh, in an elaborate form. Beowulf is about hero. Judith is, is all about heroism. Not all, uh, mostly about heroism, if not all. And see this Junius manuscript that is uh, preserved in Oxford in Bodleian Library. It is Genesis, Exodus, Daniel, Christ, and Saturn. Very religious, huh? ecclesiastical purpose. It is evident over here that in these manuscripts, these manuscripts are taken care of properly because their concern was religious. The Exeter book. Here <clears throat> you can find the Wanderer, the Seafarer, Widsit, Dare, and many more short stories. The names of the creations that I am mentioning here, that I'm mentioning here, they these works are of Anglo-Saxon period. These works are of Anglo-Saxon period and it is all about, it is, it is their name uh, and the different sources and different places where they are preserved. As I told you in the very beginning that four manuscripts are there and 30,000 lines of Anglo-Saxon literature or poetry is preserved. The first one was MS Vitellius, 15 British Museum. The second was, one was Bodellian Library, Oxford. This is the third one, Exeter in which you can find the Wanderer, the Seafarer, the Bitsith, Deus Lament, and many more. And this one is the fourth one. That is Versailles book. Here, again, we find that religious or the ecclesiastical things. Andreas, the fate of the apostles, address of a soul to the body, the dream of the rude and Eli. These are religious writings, and we can easily find it. So these are the four manuscripts that I mentioned, and we can find all those lot all that canon of uh, anglo-saxon period in these very four museums or these very four places and this Versailles book is it is preserved in north italy northern side of italy in one library over there this is preserved and you can easily see that you see the writings of this period which have as i told you in the very beginning uh, as i started to the describing about these four different manuscripts and the sources or the places where they are preserved. I told you that the writings of this period, which have ecclesiastical importance, were taken care of. But heroic poetry was not considered that important and hence preservation of it was not done in that fashion. See, Gregory the Great, he sent Augustine in Kent. Now you can recall, let's go back to those uh, uh, that previous slide in which I mentioned that uh, the kingdoms of uh, these different tribes, Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. So, who were ruling in Jutes? Whose kingdom was there in, uh, in Kent? Jutes were there. Jutes were there, and they were lesser in number, and that's when the conversion was easy. That's what St. Augustine, St. Augustine was sent by Gregory the Great in 597 AD to do the conversion. And the conversion of the English people started from here. And this was sponsored by Roman Church. Roman Church was more concerned for ecclesiastical purposes, and Irish Church, it was also doing the religious thing, but its concerns were about heroes also. The most important political thing that happened in those times, it was in 632 AD, that King of Northumbria, you can again consult that map that, uh, that I showed in the beginning of Anglo Saxon kingdoms, that King of Northumbria whose name was Edwin, and who was of Christian faith, he was killed by Penda. The king, the name of the king was Penda, and he was pagan. He was of pagan belief. And he was king of Mercia. 
just below Northumbria, you can find that Mercia, huge place and a wide expand, expansion. And he was ruler of their penda and he was of pagan belief. I'm, I assume it that you all are belief for the students. Professor, they are already knowing it. For the students, uh, pagan are those people who worship nature. For them, nature was God. And Christian are the people who followed Christ or those who followed the preachings of Christ. And uh, in Northumbria, in 632, Christians were thrown out. They disappeared thoroughly. And uh, Christian church in Northumbria was totally demolished. There was no one there. And uh, how it was re-established? It was re-established by Aiden and his followers. <clears throat> they came from Iona. And they re-established Christianity over there. So why Anglo-Saxon is being discussed? Because the Anglo-Saxon heroic poetry that we will uh, study about definite poets and definite creations in later slides. But this is the condition. These are the things that I must tell you and you must be aware of these things. And uh, this creates the backing and the basis to understand that why heroic poetry was celebrated in those times and why uh, not only heroic, uh, religious also. And you will find some uh, social concerns also in those times. So that is really uh, without understanding these points, without understanding these facts, without knowing, without being aware of these facts, it will not be easy for a student of literature to understand that why this kind of literature was produced and why it is called Anglo-Saxon literature. So <clears throat> it is clear, it is clear to all of you that uh, I am just uh, revising it once again that Tacitus in his Germania called three tribes as Germanic people and Beats in his Ecclesiastical History of England mentions it that these three tribes came, uh, came from German, they, they were German nations, they were strong people from German nations. They came here and they established their kingdoms, the respective kingdoms were Angles, Saxons and that of Jews. They established their different kingdoms in the respective areas, the different, that is known as England today. Angles were largest in numbers, Saxons were the fighters, so they combined and in their collaborative effort, they conquered almost the whole area, the whole expand that comes after the Dover Hills, the White Dover Hills, the Albus, the Albion. So the Albion was conquered by Angles and Saxons. And since Angles were larger in numbers, they were in majority, they were influential. They named that specific, specific place as Anglaland, which in due course of time became Anglaland. And with the passage of time, that became England. So everything is settled over there. And after that, we saw where the kingdoms were, the, the different kingdoms were there. And they started ruling. And from there started the production of literature. And 30,000 lines of Anglo-Saxon literature or poetry is preserved only. Most of them are of uh, ecclesiastical importance, that is religious importance. So these are the things that we discussed. Now, we'll start talking about definite creations that the definite lot of literature which comprises or which uh, constitutes what we call as anglo-saxon literature and the most famous one with anonymous writer is Bjorn. you all might have <clears throat> listened to this that beowulf beowulf was a hero and his uh, killing of the sea monster Grendel is mentioned in this whole uh, one. The heroism of Beowulf is mentioned and is appreciated, is celebrated <coughs> in this uh, creation. Skilled was the ruler. Spear Danes. Danes, Danes with, uh, Spear was the name of the country and Skilled was the ruler. And uh, after him, Rothgar, H R O T H G A R. Rothgar, we also pronounce him as Rothgar. He became the king, and there was a problem. They built a. I'm telling you the story and the, the story line of Beowulf, rather, very in a, very short and precise and uh, short form. As I told you, Spear Days was the name of the nation, and uh, Skilled was the name of the king, and he was growing old. And after the Rothgar, he became the king, and uh, they built. At the shore, a great hall that was known as Herot. Herot, H-E-O-R-O-T, Herot. 
they built a hall here out where all the knights and all the gallants they they went there they sat there together they drank they guzzled they gorged and they listened to the poetry the minstrel song or the scops song scops or the minstrels were the people <clears throat> who sang for the warriors in the leisure time so they listened to them so here it was the name of the palace but what was the problem that after making merry after the party was over when most of the fighters and warriors slept in that beautiful hall of hirot a sea monster with the name of beowulf it appeared it came and it took away one of the warriors and, and it was its, its habit it was happening again and again it came and it took away one of the warriors crushed his bones and swallowed it rothkar was very much worried that if this will continue so all the fighters will be lost and the power of the nation and the people who uh, are were responsible for the power of the nation they all will be vanished one by one so he was very much worried and as a solution in his life came the arrival of beowulf his nephew who came to him after uh, with the men of uh, with the crew of 14 people they crossed uh, oceans and they came to <clears throat> rock to solve his problem it was a beautifully done that oceanic poetry beautiful uh, piece of ocean poetry you can find there uh, when the 14 people forming a crew and they are coming to rothgar for the serving of the purpose that means for the killing of grendel the monster the sea monster for in hirot so he came there and they as was the custom they all <clears throat> they all were uh, there in the hall of hirot and the party was on and when the party was over they all slept over there again the monster came and it as it, as was its habit the monster grendel he tried to snatch away or he tried to take away one of the warriors and unfortunately the warrior on which it took attempt it, he was beowulf beowulf caught grendel followed him a ferocious fight was there and grendel was killed beowulf went with him in the deep in the water and killed him uh, killed grendel came out with his sinews and it was hung at the at the door of that beautiful hall hero and that was a symbol of the victory of beowulf but the story does it end here this was the first part in which beowulf kills grendel the sea monster when mother of grendel her name was brimwulf they call her as brimwulf they call her as brimwulf and uh, mary wulf that is also your mere wulf m e r w i f mere wulf or brim wulf b r i m w i l f brim wulf or mere wulf or uh, grand wulf grand g r u n d w y r g e n these are certain names of that same mother of sea monster grendel let us take one name and we are calling her as brim wulf because it is uh, similar to uh, in one way similar to beowulf beowulf's mother brimwulf so beowulf uh, not beowulf's mother uh, grendel's mother brimwulf and the name is similar to beowulf so beowulf killed grendel and when the mother deep in the ocean came to know about it that his son was her son was killed she decided to take revenge and again she attacked the same hall hirot and she was also killed brimwulf was also killed by beowulf and after that beowulf ruled for several years with uh, not that big hindrances but he ruled very efficiently in a very good manner so this was the story of beowulf and uh, two or three noticeable things in beowulf is the heroic element or the celebration of heroism the celebration of a person appearing and fighting on the monster all alone killing the monster and doing good for society this was heroism that was celebrated in beowulf in the creation of beowulf the second thing that is noticeable is the beautiful ocean poetry the beautiful ocean poetry but you can find bits of it 
especially in that episode when beowulf decided to visit hrothgar with 14 men in his ship after crossing ocean so that was a beautiful this this is about beowulf now see <clears throat> widset 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 is also one of the creations of those types that is a uh, anglo saxon that we call as anglo saxon so in what happens in widset Vidsit is a poem, and the word Vidsit means wanderer, the person who wanders without a specific purpose. But here it was a person. Vidsit is what uh, <clears throat> wanderer or the wide goer. What happens? Sometimes it is regarded that uh, Vidsit is the oldest composition in English language. So, uh, author uh, is <laughs> unknown as Beowulf because it is the oldest, so we cannot trace the author. Who was the author? We cannot say. but it is one of the oldest it is a personal account of a minstrel's life <coughs> minstrels two words are very important when a minstrel or scop s c o p scop minstrel or scop they were the singers who sang the songs of glory for the rulers or the for the fighters they are also known as gleemen widset is a poetic account or a personal account of a minstrel who wandered who went from one place to another sang verses or sang poems and he got reward in return so widset is all about that <clears throat> and probably it was written uh, nearly for 4th century maybe some poems were added later but the original creation you can date it at date it in the beginning of the 4th century so see it was one of the prominent professions in those times it is very much easily visible here that the life of a minstrel that is minstrels the people who were composing poems or who were singing verses or who were singing and who were uh, <coughs> admirers of the rulers or who were praising rulers in their compositions they got reward in those times also i am talking about 4th century so we come to know about this tradition by reading witsel one of the oldest compositions in english literature oh this uh, creation also tells us that uh, being a scop or being a minstrel was a profession in those times and people were paid for that the, <clears throat> the next one the next important creation was deor slamant there was also a minstrel or a scop first of all keep this in mind minstrel or scop that was one of the prominent or respectable professions or the rewarding professions of those times so there was also also a minstrel he was also a scop but he was not happy or a stoic kind of minstrel as mentioned in witsit Vidsit, now see, there is a difference. Vidsit is all about the life of a minstrel, life of a scop who wanders from one place to another, singing verses and got reward in return. But Deor's lament, lament as the word suggests it. It is also uh, an account of a scop or a minstrel, but not in the fashion as Vidsit was presented. Deor's lament is all about. the unhappiness or the dissatisfaction or the discontent of a scop there also did the same thing as was done in witsit by the minstrel he also sang and it was a section times and he was not glad in wandering as in witsit the minstrel was going from one place to another and singing verses and singing songs and he was happy about that if not happy he was not that much bothered about it but in there there is also a minstrel or a scop and he is not very happy with his profession and the part that he hates the most is wandering from here uh, to there or moving from this and that but still in this lamentation one thing is uh, worth mentioning that in this lamentation of there he is able to find an optimism as most of his verses in this lament ends with that he overwent this also may i the ending lines 
most of the verses in most of the verses we'll find most of the lyrics we can find that he is saying that that he overwent this also may i which means his sorrow passed away and so will mine so there is lamenting his condition there is lamenting about his condition that is not happy about wandering here and there and singing songs and verses but still he is optimistic still he is hopeful that some day this will be over because others got over this he will also be out of it so the poem's note is optimistic though it is a lamentation and there there's lament it is one of the most important creations of those times of anglo saxon times to see till here we can trace it out easily it is very much evident that it is all about court court poets and in court who were the rulers and who were sitting at the upper positions they were the people who were fighters the fighters or the rulers they were being celebrated in that in in the creations of those times they were the heroes till now we cannot easily find about ecclesiastical or religious things were being written but till now as we uh, discussed about beowulf we discuss about wit set and now we are discussing about devo's lament in these three creations and these are one of the earliest or one of the most one of the oldest creations of our like of this uh, english language but in these three creations the earliest one the oldest one we cannot find even a trace of religious element what we can find that it is either thoroughly a social concern of a very common minstrel or a scop in the society in those times or it is about the hero or the fighter who fought in those times and fought for what fought for liberty or equality or fraternity no fought for existence in beowulf liberty fraternity equality liberalism romanticism or uh, neo classicism or nothing was there the fight of beowulf with grendel and his mother uh, grendel's mother brimwill it was all about it was all for the existence because had beowulf not killed grendel and brimwill grendel's mother they would have devoured the whole generation of the fighters so <clears throat> fighters who were celebrating in the hall of now see how beautifully they are presenting it the allegorical interpretations are always possible for any creation i don't think that the writer while writing these things was that much concerned about some allegorical interpretations but the life of beowulf shows one thing any any elaboration any explanation any illustration will never negate the heroic element of beowulf in that creation beowulf because beowulf the poetry if it is if we can say it a true poetry it is all about the fight for existence that had be a wolf not fought he would have vanished along with the whole generation of fighters he fought with grendel he killed him he killed grendel's mother brimwulf and why he did all this he did for survival survival what was not that easy and who who were surviving with all dignity they were the fighters they were the heroes the heroes who fought and who did the things and who fought for their existence they only existed and they only ruled and that is why that's why i say that either anglo saxon poetry was about the pre christian heroism or it was about religious or ecclesiastical purposes so till now we have seen that uh, beowulf was heroism and witsit and uh, this deus lament it was about social life or the social life conditions of minstrel or the scop one of the common professions in those times and one of the respectable profession in those times and both the angles are both the angles are visible if we consider through different uh, creations in witsit in general we are getting the account of the life of a minstrel or a scop on the contrary in there there's lament what we are finding we are finding yet again a story about an unhappy minstrel or scop who is not happy about wandering from one place to another place he also do, does the same thing as was done by the minstrel in witsit but in witsit no trace of unhappiness or discontent or dissatisfaction is there on the contrary you can find uh, huge traces of 
unhappiness, discontent, and dissatisfaction in Leo's lament, as the name suggests. It is a lamentation. But the good thing and the noticeable thing is that the Deus lament, though a lamentation, it ends with a hope. It ends with a hope. It is optimistic in tone. Now, the next creation that uh, we'll consider is the seafarer. You see, as I told you, that Beowulf was all about heroism. It was all about heroism. <clears throat> and the life of a hero, his fights for existence. The seafarer is also concerned about the hardships of sea life. Sea is playing a very important part. That's why in the very beginning I told you that when you will uh, go to England, the place that we know as England today, through sea route, because it all was coming from the sea route. It is all about the sea, the ocean life, it is all about the ocean poetry. It is all about the hardships of sea. And it is all about it. Is, it, it uh, the sea um, was the personification of life for the people in those times. Sea was very much connected to it. The sea, when uh, we are talking about uh, Beowulf also, the monster from where it came, it came from sea. That means sea was giving the challenges for the existence. And these people, these brave, these brave heroes, they fought against all the hurdles, hindrances that sea presented to them. And the seafarer is also about the hardships of sea life. And it is uh, it has two distinct parts, basically. The first part deals with the struggles of the sea life, as I'm mentioning again and again, that how difficult it was to survive. Uh, and the second part is having an allegorical importance where sea troubles are denoting the troubles of life, as I told you. The sea was an integral part in those times. And here in Seafarer, there are two distinct parts. The first part in overall Seafarer deals with hardships of sea life. And it is in two distinct parts. The first part deals with the struggles of sea life. And the second part is of allegorical importance. It is uh, allegory, basically, where sea is personified as life. And the troubles of sea they are troubles of life. So this was seafare. Now, wall there, or the vulture of Aquitaine. This was also one of the creations of those times. The Valder is the story of Valder or the Walter of Aquitaine. And uh, <clears throat> what happened in Valder? Valder and his wife or bride, you can say Hilgund, how they were captivated and how they escaped. Walter was a fighter also. Again, see heroism, the fighting spirit is here. So it is about <clears throat> captivation of Walder. That only two leaves of this original manuscript, uh, original manuscript of Walder, only two leaves are found. Two leaves are there. And on the account, on the basis of those two leaves, the story that we can make out or the researchers made out, it was about the story of Valdir and his bride, Hildgun. And uh, in German also, in old German literature also, we find the same story. And its name is Nibelungenelet. I'm spelling it. N-I-B-E-L-U-N-G-E-N-L-I-E-D. Nibe Langen Lied. Nibe Langen Lied. It is in old German literature, we find the same story of Waldair that is of our, that is of the language we are concerned with here. So that is Waldair. It is also in German. So how the story goes, it is uh, about, as I told you, his, his wife or bride, Hildgun and they, they uh, in the court of Attila, they were held captive. And how they fought when uh, they were trying to escape, <clears throat> Valdir, he found that one of his best friends is also uh, fighting against him. But still he fought and he managed to come out of that captivity. So this is the celebration of here. 
This is the celebration of liberty. This is the celebration of independence. Now see, something is being added. As the time is passing on, we started from Beowulf. It was all about heroism. It was about fight for existence. After that, we, cons we discussed about uh, glimpses of uh, common life in those times and the common profession of a scop or a minstrel in those times in Witsit, in general, in Deus Lament, the problems or the unhappiness or the discontent of uh, scops or minstrel life. Again, we uh, discussed, seaf discussed seafarer in which uh, we discussed about the problems or the hardships of the sea life. And now in Voldair, a thing is being added, an element is being added, and that element is the concern of a man or a woman or a person about his or her independence in life. Now, in the court of Attila, when Helgen and Voldair, that means husband and wife, they were held captive, they fought for their independence. And while fighting, Voldair found that one of his best friends is also fighting against him. And how he fought them, that, that, that left him, you know, that left him bewildered. He was flabbergasted. My friend is also uh, fighting against me. But he managed his emotions, he fought well, and he, along with his wife, came out of that trap, uh, that captivity of court of Attila. So here one element is being added, and that element is that of heroism with independence. So Voldaire talks about independence. That means not only heroism, gradually the values of life were coming in the literature, were coming in the concerns of literary people. They were being depicted in literature heroism along with some values related to humanity and independence is the foremost independence is the most important one so independence along with heroism was celebrated in wall there and this shows that the nation which was formed the geographical entity which was named as england now was not only concerned about heroism but also about some human values and independence was one of them and Voldaire and his wife, Hildgun, they fought for their independence and they fought against all lords and they came out of it. So this is about Voldaire. Now till now, we discuss about the creations, the important and the creations that we can find uh, <clears throat> in the lot or in the canon of Anglo-Saxon literature. And we started it from uh, Beowulf. We discussed Witsith. We discussed uh, Deus Lament, we discussed Seafarer, and now Voldaire is also known to you. Now let us discuss some poets, poets of this age who were of importance. Kaerman, the first and the foremost poet of the Anglo-Saxon Milton of our English literature. We know him as Anglo-Saxon Milton. Now, uh, very little is known about Cadman, but uh, as we know that in uh, missionaries, uh, abbesses are there, abbots are there, so uh, they leave. Uh, they leave for. Uh, they live for a mission. They propagate Christianity. And that is their mission of their life, along with education and all. So he was part of it, uh, one of the nuns, uh, Abbess, rather, Abbess is the uh, exact word for that. Hilda was her name, uh, and there was a monastery of hers where Cadman lived. So I'm uh, just reading, or you can find it out easily anywhere, the story of Cadman, but still, I'm telling it, that there was a monastery of Abbess Hilda. And a brother, as we see that in missionary schools till date, we can find brother, sister, father, they are all there. We call the teachers or the missionaries, those who are teaching over there, we call them as and brothers and fathers. We are all aware of that. That is in different congregations in the, uh, of Christianity and different missions, they do that. So that is a designation kind of thing. So brothers are there. So in that Abbas uh, Hilda's monastery, there was a brother whose name was Kaidman. Who look after uh, who, who looked after the stable of that uh, monastery he lived there one night what happened that he slept and he was not able to write he was not able to speak properly also in those times but he was learning those things and what happened one night that when he was sleeping in the stable of which he was taking care of 
he dreamt or he resumed, or he was in a delirium god knows but the next morning when he woke up he was able to compose verses he started talking in verses and that was a miracle and it is believed an anecdote goes that cadmon was gifted by muse in dreams some goddess came and she blessed him that now you will be able to compose verses in the best of the ecclesiastical poems they are by cadmon they are by cadmon in english literature the cadmon works in general if we talk about the he wrote many things the story uh, that i was saying cadmon uh, he was commanded that cadmon sing for me some heavenly voice called him and he said i cannot sing the question was asked twice and thrice and uh, suddenly it happened that he started singing and after that the great the, he started uh, composing verses and most of his verses uh, if not all they are all for uh, all about ecclesiastical or religious purposes uh, one more thing cadmon was credited or attributed some works are attributed to him but uh, many of the works we are not sure about that it was written by cadmon but still they were in fervor in temper very much similar to that the greatest work attributed to cadmon paraphrase that's why we uh, the historians they coined a term and they term it as cadmonian so the literature produced in those times of ecclesiastical uh, purposes if they are in close connection with uh, the style with cadmon they are called cadmonian literature so the greatest work attributed to cadmon is paraphrase in which there is a uh, anglo saxon milton as i told you it is called it includes genesis exodus and a part of daniel in the paraphrase we find this much genesis exodus and a part of daniel and it it is easily evident over here that it is mostly about the religious writing it is uh, about ecclesiastical it is uh, for ecclesiastical purpose and beads as beads uh, venerable beads about him uh, we discussed in the very first or the second slide or the third slide beads also once said that uh, cadmon transformed the whole course of bible history into most delightful poet before cadmon before cadmon the biblical stories were never said in poetic form and after him also milton was the person in puritan age who dealt with those themes like paradise lost or paradise regained and saturn and uh, mephistopheles and all he dealt with those and uh, that's why uh, dealing with biblical stories and composing verses based on them cadmon is also known as anglo saxon melt and again i am repeating it it is worth mentioning over here and we must all we all must be aware about this that cadmon is uh, called anglo saxon milton because he composed verses based on biblical stories and most of the works those were of religious importance in those times not though not sure that they were written by cadmon or not we term it them as or the historians they started calling it as cadmonian and not sure that they were uh, written up, written by cadmon or not but they are called cadmonian because of their fervor and temperament because of they are dealing with ecclesiastical or religious purposes and again i am repeating that assurance of beads venerable beads who in his history of english people or in the history of england wrote for the first time that cadmon transformed the whole course of bible history into most delightful poetry not poetry in common not poetry of ordinary level the most delightful poetry in those times calling someone to write a poetry and that too in the most delightful manner and that too the venerable beats kind of a venerable beats was a person who wrote uh, history of england and history of english people but he was a person who was concerned with religious things he was concerned with church he was a preacher people listened to him and it was not easy to impress him and if he is saying one of the most authentic accounts of those times if we consider history is beats uh, history of english people or history of Eng england 
and when he says that it was uh, he was the person cadman was the person who transformed the whole biblical history into most delightful form of poetry that means he is saying about cadman in the superlative terms so we can and the the fragments which are available when the paraphrasing is done when they are decoded and really it is found that he was poet of he was poet and uh, who showed his meticulous preparation his clinical precision while writing so cadman was celebrated that anglo saxon milton he was it is uh, very important for the students to remember it that anglo saxon milton was cadman the cinewolf yet again cinewolf also was a writer of those times he was one of the earliest poets who signed his works who and and that's why it becomes uh, easy to make it out that what was written by him and what was not written by him it, it becomes pretty easy to decode so uh, cinewolf was also one of the greatest anglo saxon poets without any doubt and uh, except the unknown author of beowulf he can be said to be the greatest of those time as far as the works of cinewolf are concerned uh, the only signed poems of cinewolf they are the christ juliana the fates of apostles and elie the some of the poets they are attributed to cinewolf but he but the signature of cinewolf is not found on those on the manuscripts of those creations as i told you while discussing about cinewolf in the very beginning that cinewolf was the greatest anglo one of the greatest anglo saxon poets who signed his works and uh, on these works the christ juliana the fate of the apostles and elin we can found we can find it signed by cinewolf but certain works are attributed to him but they are not signed by him and these works are andreas phoenix dream of the rude descent into hell gaslap the wanderer <coughs> so these are the things um, which are not signed by cinewolf but still they are attributed to him because of the fervor and the temperament as happens in the case of cadman but the influence was influence of cadman in religious aspects was greater than that of cinewolf that's why we get the term uh, cadmonian and uh, we never get the term cinewolf here so uh, this was about uh, cinewolf and uh, <clears throat> Alfred the Great. He was a king of Anglo-Saxons in ninth century, and he translated many chronicles and the works of prominent historians of those times. And Alfred, uh, his uh, regime, uh, we can say, uh, uh, he ruled till nine hundred one A.D. and uh, he translated many good works of written till those times, like Orissa's Universal History, Universal History, and Geography. and the beads history also he translated in that acceptable form of language in those time and the, the chronicles that the picture of that book is here the anglo saxon chronicles is the one of the most considerable and one of the most important creations of alfred the great who was also the king of those time so overall what we have seen what we can assume easily that anglo saxon if we have to summarize it if we have to keep it uh, you know simple and if you have to keep it short let us do it once again let us uh, revise it when i say anglo saxon first of all we became aware of the name the tagline from where this name came and after that we came to know about the place the geographical entity which was, which was named england and after that we came to know that how the things happened how the churches they tried roman church and irish church they were in conflict and how christianity found it difficult to get spread that means english people were not easy people to get converted or to accept christianity so it was done by gregory the great and saint augustine uh, and it started uh, in 697 i think 597 it started in 597 ad and uh, christianization of certain parts of the thumbria was done but one the most important political happening of this whole period was killing of killing of a christian king of northumbria by the pagan king of mercia 
Edwin, the king of Northumbria, was of Christian faith. He was killed by King Penda of Mercia, who was of pagan belief. And this showed that in that time, this is the happening of 632 AD. That till 632 AD, political things were not stable. And religious belief, one common religious belief for all was not there. They still believed in the heroic principles and the pagans, they worshipped nature in those times also and the creations also. You can see, sea was given a prime importance in the creations of those times. When the monster comes in the uh, literature of those times, it comes from the sea. When some problem occurs, it occurs from the sea. When a uh, hardship of life has to be shown, it is shown through sea in the seafarer. And uh, <clears throat> some glimpses of common life we also uh, saw in Widsith and uh, Seafarer. Uh, what uh, Widsith and Deor's Lament, we saw that also. And uh, we saw uh, Cadman, why he's called Anglo Saxon Milton. And uh, we discussed about Cinewolf. We discussed about certain creations of them. And uh, from here, from this very point, this started. And uh, one of the translations I'm showing you, you can easily see it. Music and song where the heroes sat, the glee would rang. A song uprose when Rodger's scop gave the hall good cheer. You can see the ball is set rolling from that very time. The purpose was clear. The keynote was struck that the writing, the poetry, the creations of this literature, English literature, they will give us all a good cheer and the music is still going on and from and this is a story in brief of that period of that canon and the bulk of english literature and from here it all started and i'm glad and i'm thankful to dr banerji and vasudhara once again that uh, this is my lecture from where it all began for this superb lecture series thank you uh, listeners for being patient and listening to me now it's your turn i'll uh, Listen to your questions and I'll try to answer them. Please. Over to you, Dr. Banerjee. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, as I expected and as I ensured uh, my participants that we are in for a cerebral feast uh, because I assured the participants that I was aware of the resource person. Uh, in fact, all the resource persons who are in this course, uh, either me or Basudara personally knows very well about the academic credentials as well as the academic credibility of those people who are in this uh, lecture series and that's why we assure you that you are in for a complete cerebral feast for the next 14 days so as expected and as promised thank you uh, dr vimlindu uh, for taking us back to, for making us nostalgic and taking us back to the graduation days and I would just like to I would just like to assure the graduate students who are in this course that uh, uh, we really uh, we really feel that had zoom been in our graduation days we could have done wonders in some of the lectures uh, so you all are here for some very beautiful interesting academically very very enriching lectures please ensure that you participate in this lecture series. Don't miss any lecture of this lecture series. And I'm sure as a graduate student, this will give you a very, very good clarity and understanding of the subject that you are in. This is the subject. This is the base uh, of, uh, you know, of, of uh, English literature. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bimlindu, for, thank you, Dr. Uh, for such an enriching session and uh, for making some of us who are who are in this course uh, nostalgic once again so if you permit i would now take few questions from the sure 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 i'm waiting for them the first question uh, as expected you know uh, the question is uh, in your opinion uh, on what grounds did the roman church differ from the irish church i told you while i was discussing it uh, that Roman church, they were more concerned about the ecclesiastical purposes or for the spread of Christianity. Irish church was doing the same, but their concern, their hero worship was different. If you can recall, in the very beginning, I told you that Celtic people or the Welsh, as Germanic people called them, there, was, there were two groups. 
one was of germanic people as tacitus gives it in germania and that was a group of uh, goths burgundians lombards and other tribes combined to Together, they saw some. They they felt uh, that affinity because of the common language and the common heroes they worshipped, and they uh, were not accepting other heroes or other things. And uh, Roman Church was more concerned about Jesus and his preachings and all that. Irish people were also doing the same, but they were also uh, celebrating some other heroes other than Jesus. it was in the norse mythology they took their heroes from norse mythology as well the heroes of denmark and all that uh, so uh, purpose was the same spreading christianity reaching but their heroes differed their language differed and it was uh, fight for supremacy that who is going to be dominant factor in the spreading of christianity that's why the people who were concerned with these two different churches roman church people they were spending a lot they were rich group ireland people they were the churches they were not that rich as uh, as the roman churches were so they were also in the same business they were also spreading it and as it happens as it happens that uh, in the same business two competitors are there the difference was just because of competition and just because of a bit uh, uh, you know difference in their different concerns that means the heroes and the language that this one is superior and this one this one must uh, be given preference and this is the real way as you see if a uh, uh, if two shops are of a same name both of them claim that we are the original one so <laughs> this was the case this was the case this with this analogy you can understand so they were different not in the purpose but they were different in the style my co organizer and a very erudite scholar uh, dr basudara rai uh, roy has uh, a message for you dr vimlindu and i will uh, i will quote her mm -hmm. Uh, a wonderful and very engaging beginning by dr vimlendu thank you so much for your very enriching presentation thank you thank you basudara and it all became possible because of you and dr banerji so thanks a lot the next question uh, did the vikings in any way change the language or politics of england see uh, whatever group or whatever tribes were there there were many there were many as when we talk about germanic people when we talk about other groups there were goths there were lombards there were uh, burgundians and many were there so everyone impacted in one way or other but their uh, their way of life certainly as the spirit was of the uh, more the two tribes which impacted the most were angles and saxons so what they did the fighting spirit and the organization and the rulers the conquering factor was the main factor so everyone contributed in one way or other certain things were taken from someone when the vikings of course they were one, if they are known till date if their style and things are being discussed that they certainly contributed in certain manner and the language languages you see uh, the language was common for germanic people it was a bit different for celtic or welsh people but there was still something in common the difference was not that noticeable but still they considered their version to be the best one or to be the truer one or to be the right one so of course every group i am naming them again the burgundians the goths the lombards the vikings they all they all contributed in their manner and the, to be specific and to uh, enumerate their specific contributions so being student of literature i am not that aware of their specific contributions but still uh, if as far as literature is concerned as far as the way of life is concerned certainly they contributed and up to what extent that is uh, i can't quantify it how can i quanti quantify it but as the literature shows the common spirit of uh, wandering of exploring and of conquering that is also very much evident in viking that is very much there in the literature and people of those times thank you thank you uh, next question is which is the oldest poem beowulf or witset witset is the oldest poem uh, regarded because uh, most of the historians they mention witset as beowulf became famous because of its uh, heroic concern beowulf became famous because of its heroic story and uh, its the uh, ability of the story to transcend the temporal limits that's why it became more famous and the second factor why it became more famous because the part of the beowulf that is uh, preserved as a, a you know manuscript 
as i told you in the very beginning it is preserved there so the fragment which is preserved the fragment of witsit and the fragment of beowulf the larger fragment of beowulf is preserved with us in comparison to that of witsit so in witsit we are not uh, witsit that that's why not be, uh, it became uh, it didn't became uh, become that famous uh, but as far as the age is concerned many historians most of the historians excepting few and uh, that they are not considerable uh, most of the respectable historians they consider witsit to be the oldest one the wimlendu uh, since this is a very important question from competitive examinations point of view can you give a uh, you know reliable reference source for this answer of yours as some yes. of the participants are in yes uh, you can consider you you can find it in uh, david dyche's book uh, i i think uh, you all are aware of that a critical history of english literature in the very first volume you can find it in the very first chapter you can find it written there you can and for uh, first year students those who are not i am pretty sure that they will not be able to comprehend dashes thoroughly so for you i can say that you go to the footnotes of uh, william j long there also you can find it okay so to be specific to be precise these are the two references uh, from where i can say it is you can find it written in the critical history of english literature volume 1 by david dashes and uh, in the footnotes of william j long uh, that a famous book with first year students i think very good thank you uh ne ne the next question is how was life different in anglo saxon pe uh, period taking mm -hmm. into account the superstitious belief or believing in lucky charms in that pagan or pre christian era okay yes uh, <clears throat> they believed in that you know sir sir you can find it very easily if you closely observe the creations of those times uh let us consider uh, beowulf okay so in beowulf making merry they were uh, celebrating their victory and all the fighters they got together at the same place and uh, they started partying and all so uh, superstition was there or not i don't i cannot say because uh, king rothger you see just you watch it watch it closely what i am mentioning you just listen to it please whoever has asked the whoever has asked the question is a very important one king rothgar when he found out that in hirod the hall in which they did the celebrations a sea monster comes and takes away one of his or uh, one of his fighters and uh, swallows him he never tried to fight him or the mighty soldiers group was there but they never tried to fight him because it was their belief that anything that is coming from sea that is invincible they cannot conquer it and who thought it was it was a thought of those people who themselves were the warriors so superstition was obviously there and sea or the ocean that was a main thing so all the superstitions all the ways of life the hardships or the easiness or the comfort or the celebration or the sorrow they all in some or other way were related to sea and the sea, coming of a sea mon monster and believing it quite easily that it was able to devour all the greatest fighters it is a sort of superstition so superstitions were obviously there and uh, later on with the uh, when the scientific temperament is started uh, the english people they uh, specifically uh, in victorian times in victorian times it happened in 1859 when charles darwin came up with his origin of species then only certain beliefs started uh, changing before that a lot of superstitions were there in english way of life and in english history not in the social history only also in the history of english literature you will find many episodes of superstitions and that i tried to explain with the example of beowulf because it uh, it is a very popular and famous story and it is written in those times so you can easily uh, think about it that sea monster or the sea monster being invincible these are a kind of superstitions that people were living with that because uh, that was celebrated in that time you when it was it was celebrated so yes people of england in those times lived with superstitions and all and it gradually changed and it took a lot of time a hell lot of time and from victorian age these people who say themselves as white man and uh, to civilized people at white as white man's burden uh, they themselves were not very scientific before uh, victorian uh, era thank you 
Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what was the religious affiliation of the Anglo-Saxons in pre-Christian era and on what ground Christianity could seep through the existing religious fervor and led to conversion? Okay. Before it, uh, they were pagans, to be precise and to say dot. They were, on dot, it is, they were pagans. They were the believers of nature because they were in very close contact with nature, the way of life and the geographical surrounding in which they were living and what was their abode and what was their uh, see, what was, uh, habitat. It was, uh, it was not a friendly environment or friendly atmosphere or friendly habitat. They were fighters by nature. So they believed in the power of nature. They believed in cloud, they believed in rain, they believed in sea, they believed in everything. So uh, this was the paganism was the religious evolution that we can say they were connected to they, they were pagans they can deem them the people of those times they may be they can be deemed as pagans because the kingdoms when you see the map when you'll see the map you'll find that Northumbria was there where Christianity was being flourished and when Christianity was being uh, preached and it was the conversion was being done just below Northumbria you'll find Mercia Mercia was the nation not nation actually there was the that, that was a geographical area which was thoroughly pagan and as I told you in the discussion, it happened, how it happened, they were in constant tussle. Whenever Christians tried to enter the arena of pagans, pagans fought it hard. And many of the times they ousted the defeated Christian missionaries. As I told you in 597 AD, Gregory the Great sent Saint Augustine to preach Christianity and he was doing it fine. But in 632, the most important political events of that time, ha that time happened. That answers your, the second part of your question, that how they came through. The pagans, they were disturbed because Christians were trying to spread in their territory. So what happened? The king of Christians in those times, the king who accepted Christianity, his name was Edwin and he was king of Northumbria. And Christianity was popular in Northumbria, just below Northumbria, Marcia was there, and their king, his name was Penda, he was pagan. And when Edwin and his men tried to propagate Christianity in Marcia, in a pagan area, Penda killed Edwin, and that was uh, one of it, one, uh, that can be termed as one of the first murders, political murders of those times. Penda pagan king killed Christian king and Christianity was overpowered. It was thrown away from that very land. So constantly Christians, they kept on sending their missionaries. Constantly they were defeated. Say you can say easily that they were defeated six out of 10 times, but they kept on sending their missionaries and gradually uh, propagating that the stories of Jesus and the biblical concerns and the Kaidman singing the verses in common uh, language it became popular and the constant, the constant sending of missionaries in those areas and the way of life when they got settled, that fighting and all those things, the pagan beliefs, they were being challenged by some of the Christians. And uh, in the due course of time, with the passage of time, somewhere it got played against pagans. So this was how it all happened. Thank you. Before I take the last question of the day, I would request our participants that we start the evening session from 6.30. You can start joining after 6.20. After 6.20. We begin at uh, uh, from 6.30 onwards, our second session today. This is the only day where we have a morning and evening session. Rest, every day we will have an evening session from 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, Dr. Vimalendu, uh, the last question of the day. Sure. And I think this is a question which is uh, befitting the occasion. How can we position mm. the relevance of these works uh, like Beowulf and uh, Wurtzit and all? How can we position the relevance of these works within the construct of contemporary discourse of literature? Okay. As I said in the beginning that uh, it is the point it is the point of time. It is the part of history of literature from where it all started. All the literary endeavors started. So uh, till date, many things have changed. Many concerns have changed. But uh, certain parameters and certain things, certain concerns related to mankind, they are not going to change ever. Like religious beliefs, like heroism, the celebration of heroism, like 
the problems of common people or the common man in the society, they will always be there and they will always find relevance in our discourses, whether it be literary or scientific. So uh, it, it can be said easily that the writings of those times which started talking about these things, they will be very relevant to all of us in all the times. And that is the reason that many uh, great authors are made, uh, great literary figures like uh, Shakespeare and all, they talked about overambition, they talked about je uh, jealousy, they talked about uh, other factors, you know, suspicion and all. So they, they will be in the uh, human race forever. With the passage of time, they are not going to go away anywhere. They are, they are not going anywhere. So um, this is the reason the concerns, the religious concerns, the celebration of heroism, and the uh, life of the common people, common man, about the profession, it will remain same forever with the society. Uh, as far as uh, society is there, as far as people are living in the society, their concerns, the tendency of hero worship, they always be there. So since these writings and these works, they have started it, uh, they have created a frame, they had, uh, reading them, we can get a glimpse that how and why to appreciate heroism and all the things. So that's why they will always be relevant to all of us. And we must celebrate this. These are treasurable things. We must keep it in our treasure. So that's why all the students of literature, they must know about these writings because all the other writings, uh, all the writings of the other stalwarts in the coming ages that you are going to listen in some insightful lectures of that poet, they all are inspired by this only, by these uh, heroes only by these common people only, by these religious concerns only, by Jesus only, by Christianity only, by paganism only. So they are going to be relevant forever. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vibhulindu. Uh, it has been a wonderful uh, session and a wonderful, insightful, enriching lecture, the testimony to the fact that the plethora of uh, congratulatory messages that are being shared in the chat box. I have shared it in your WhatsApp. Uh, you can go through those uh, messages and uh, oh i'll enjoy a yeah. great sunday to enjoy <laughs> yeah i have already i have already sent it so you please check thank it you. and thank you so much for sparing time and it is always thank wonderful you. to host you and uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so much once again on behalf of team dadwaj it was a uh, you know wonderful time a nostalgic time thank you everyone and thank, thank you everyone, everyone for especially the nostalgia. Dr. and basudara yeah thank you i'm signing off thank you so much thank you okay.